to everyone out there in the No DQ galaxy. Welcome to No DQ video here on NoDQ.com and YouTube.com slash Aaron Rift No DQ. Thank you for watching today's video. The questions come from Twitter.com slash Aaron Rift using the hashtag No DQ video. Let's go ahead and get started. First one today comes from Caitlin. How would you book Adam Cole, baby, when he comes to the main roster? Great question. Adam Cole is definitely one of the most highly regarded NXT superstars. A lot of fans see potential in him being a top talent on the main roster. The question is, will WWE utilize him correctly? And let's face it, not a lot of people have the highest hopes. Here's what I would do. One of two things. Number one, you call up all of Undisputed Era to the main roster and you have them debut as a group and let them dominate as a group in similar fashion to the NWO, maybe the Four Horsemen, Nexus before WWE screwed up Nexus, and The Shield. Have them come in, win a lot of matches, give them instant credibility and let them just take over the place. Let them be dominant. That would be one way. Another option is to have Adam Cole break away from Undisputed Era, turn him babyface, have them kick him out of the group basically, and let him come up to the main roster on his own as a babyface. Since a lot of the fans like him already, he'll get that big pop whenever he debuts and just let him be like the modern day CM Punk, you know? I definitely see a lot of similarities between him and CM Punk. He has that that underground vibe to him. A lot of fans are behind him and they will just naturally root for him to succeed in WWE. So I could definitely see him working well as a babyface or as a heel with Undisputed Era. Either way, I think that I could see him going far if WWE goes all out with him and they don't get cold feet when it comes to pushing him. Got this one here from Last Kicker. Hey Aaron, with what Vince said to be high on Mandy Rose, do you think she could become a top star in the company? She seems to have all the tools, but maybe just needs a little more experience. Your thoughts? I feel like she looks the part of a superstar. However, I just don't see all of the attributes in her just yet. I do see the similarities between her and Lana, but WWE could not get Lana to that next level. And they tried to do the same thing with Emma and that backfired. Mandy Rose right now feels like somebody from a previous era in WWE. If she can continue to improve in the ring and just become a better promo and just be an overall stronger sports entertainer, then I think there is a lot of potential for, for her. However, right now, I'm still undecided. I'm still on the fence. And we'll have to wait and see if WWE's marketing machine can make it work. But I think there's going to be more that needs to be done besides that. She's going to have to improve in all those categories, I feel, to really reach that next level. Especially when you have so many talented women in WWE right now, it's hard to stand out. And perhaps right now she's standing out for the wrong reasons. Oh, she's a hot blonde, so we're going to push her. You know, there's got to be more to it at this point. In a different era, she would have been a huge star. But now it, it's going to be a lot tougher for her because the criteria has changed and there's just so much competition. She really has to stand out of the pack in more ways than one. Got this one here from Tony. Hey Aaron, do you think Randy Orton and AJ Styles could have a great match in feud together similar to John Cena and AJ Styles? Absolutely, I think AJ Styles and Randy Orton would have a very entertaining feud and I feel like it's one of the few big SmackDown Live feuds, potential feuds, that we haven't seen yet. For the most part, the two of them have not crossed paths I think they maybe had one match against each other, if that. My memory is already drawing a blank with those guys, but 
I would definitely like to see it. I think it would be a very entertaining feud. Will it have the legacy of John Cena versus Randy Orton? Probably not, because John Cena was John Cena and Randy Orton was in his prime. And let's face it, he's older now. He's starting to move down the card. So I don't think it'll have that kind of impact. But nonetheless, I still think it'll be a really solid feud when it does happen. And I think it will happen sooner than later. Got this one here from Kyle Allen. What are your thoughts on Impact going to their fourth network in four years? Pursuit Channel, which is owned by Anthem. I did bring this up during No DQ Live several days ago. I think it's a very sad state of the company. Let's face it, very few people know what the Pursuit Channel is. It's in far less homes than Pop TV, and Pop TV wasn't in a ton of homes to begin with. It's a very, very, very low tier network. I guess if you want to put a positive spin on it, Impact might have more creative control. They might be able to push the envelope a little bit more, but I don't see how this move is going to result in any more eyeballs watching the product. Again, I hate to be negative on this, but Impact Wrestling is a dead brand. And you can do all the things you want to it, but if you do not have a brand that people care about, then nothing is going to change. I hate to say it, I just don't see where they go from here. I don't see how this is gonna do anything to turn the company's fortunes around. But somehow they've managed to stay in business and every time we think impact's down for the count, they manage to survive. And it's not like I wanna see people lose their jobs, but I'd like to see a new promotion rise up and develop a brand that has credibility that people can get invested in. And Impact Wrestling just isn't it. They had their chance, they blew it, and now there are other potential promotions out there that are starting to make some noise and people have just moved on from Impact and I don't think there's anything they can do. I really don't. They've completely lost their identity. Um, the stuff that they became known for you can get elsewhere, WWE, NXT. I mean, there are so many other options right now and Impact just doesn't bring anything innovative or new to the table. It is what it is. Got this one here from OP Cruddies. Hey Aaron, here's a cool creative idea. The Undertaker returns all of his four big gimmicks leading up to his 30 years in WWE in 2020 and all the four major pay-per-views ending it on Survivor Series with his debut gimmick. Well, this is not really a question, but I guess it is an idea and you might want my take on it. I think it is a cool idea. However, I think it's highly unlikely WWE does that. First of all, getting Undertaker to wrestle four times a year, that's easier said than done. And when he does do it, it's usually at some pay-per-view like Crown Jewel, it seems, or WrestleMania, of course. I think it would be a nice way for Undertaker's career to end if it's going to be at Survivor Series in 2020, which would be 30 years since his debut. Would not shock me if he continues to wrestle for that long. I would not mind seeing the American Badass one time, but I don't think WWE would do something where every pay-per-view he would go back to a previous persona. Um... I just don't see WWE doing that. I just cannot see it. But I think it would be cool to see one of those old characters come back. Maybe for his final match. You know, you don't have to do it as extensively as you mentioned. But maybe just for the final match, Survivor Series 2020, he comes out in his original gear, original music. I kind of like that idea. And I could realistically see that as a possibility. Got this one here from Boogeyman79. Do you think with the NXT call-ups, who do you think can have a good storyline or rivalry? I think Lacey Evans and Charlotte Flair, if booked right. I would say Lars Sullivan versus Braun Strowman. 
Lars Sullivan is a monster, and if you push him strong enough, you could potentially do Lars versus Strowman as a big feud between these two monsters, the irresistible force, not talking about Nia Jax, versus the immovable object. Lars Sullivan versus Brock Lesnar even, if WWE went all out with Lars, and I don't I don't think they're going to. I don't see Lars getting that kind of push, but if Lars really did catch on on the main roster, you theoretically could do Lars versus Brock Lesnar. So I feel like Lars, if handled correctly, there's a lot of interesting matchups you can do with him. And of course, EC3, depending on what he does, you could get him in the mix with any number of guys from Seth Rollins to Dolph Ziggler. I don't know why I mentioned Ziggler. Maybe it's just the abs. I don't know. Finn Balor. Battle of the abs between EC3 and Finn Balor. There you go. Um, not that I'm suggesting that as a booking idea, but, you know, I, I could see some potential. Like I said, in general, I think EC3 and Lars have the most potential to make it. And because I can see a lot of different potential matchups with these guys as well. This one comes from Rollins versus Styles, please. How can they ban chair shots to the head, but wrapping a steel chair around someone's throat and slamming them throat first into the steel steps are okay? Well, easy answer to this. You cannot get a concussion from doing the spot with the steel, tra steel, tra steel chair. I don't know what a chair is, but I do know what a chair is. It's something you can wrap around somebody's throat and slam them into the ground and it looks cool, and it's not going to risk a concussion. So that's why WWE will do that and not a direct chair shot to the head. I think the better question is, why can WWE not do a protected steel chair shot to the head? Triple H and Undertaker did that spot with the chair shot, and clearly the hands were up for that, yet they still got fined, reportedly. I totally understand the chair shot to the head ban, you know, the concussions, it's a real problem now and WWE is looking out for the safety of the performers. I just feel like seeing the chair shot to the gut and all that stuff is a bit lame, but to answer your question, you know, it's not a matter of a move that looks dangerous, it's a matter of doing moves that are not dangerous and no longer doing moves that are dangerous. This one comes from Tevin. Why do you think Vince McMahon pushes the monsters and giants for a short time and then turns them into jokes? Most of the giants, such as Andre, Big Show, Umaga, etc., have either been a champion once or twice, then turned into jokes or job hard. Only two exceptions are the Brothers of Destruction. Well, WWE never really turned Andre into a joke. I mean, he was at the end of his career when he faced Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania 3. Yeah, he did job out to the Ultimate Warrior, but he was at the tail end of his career. And usually when you're on your way out, you put over the younger talent. I mean, that's what Andre did. He was being a professional. He was putting over other stars when he was at the end of his career. Somebody like Big Show, you could argue WWE just completely mishandled him, which I think is a very valid thing to say. And some of these uh, some of these other guys, you know, they have their run and then just like a lot of other guys, Vince or whoever's in charge gets tired of the act and wants to move on to somebody else. And somebody like Greg Kali, he's been there for a while and after a while you have to phase out some of the older stars and replace them with newer stars. I mean, eventually you got to make some changes. Um, one thing about wrestling over the years is TV characters have a shelf life. If you have a character on television for several years, people are going to get tired of it eventually, especially when that character is on TV every single week, 52 weeks a year. Um, you want to phase out that character and get some fresh characters in there and create some new stars. So you have to do it either way. I know some people say, well, WWE just gives up on these guys, which is true, but at the same time, you need to keep building new stars and keep the shows fresh. This one comes from It's the Costanza. Who do you consider being the top big men on the lowest 
not important card in WWE. Bastion, Booger, Earthquake, Tugboat, or all of the above? Well, definitely not Bastion, Booger. Um, Earthquake was pretty good. I really enjoyed the Big Boss Man. I thought that he had some great work. How about Bam Bam Bigelow? Uh, for a guy that was never a world champion, I'm not even sure he held a mid-card title in WWE or the tag team titles. I don't think he did, but don't quote me on that. Bam Bam Bigelow was a very athletic big man, and a lot of people think of his career highlight being WrestleMania, but he had some really solid matches. I remember the King of the Ring with Bret Hart. Bam Bam Bigelow could really go, and Big Boss Man, definitely one of my favorites. Um, I thought he had a really solid match with Hulk Hogan, Steel Cage match in 1989 on Saturday night's main event. Uh, Hogan and Bossman did this big superplex spot off the top of the cage. Well, not, you know, not off the top top, but still a really cool spot. So yeah, Bigelow and Bam Bam would probably be my two favorites of the big guys that never won a world title in WWE. Got this one here from Chris. Hey, Aaron, if you could amount Rushmore, if you could... Make a hey Aaron, if you could make a Mount Rushmore, I think that's what he's trying to say for the top five wrestling families in WWE history, who would you have on there? All right, let me think about this. Well, the Hart family, of course, the Guerreros, the Von Erics, those would be my top three. The Funks, of course. As for a fifth family, now I'm starting to blank on this one. How about the Wyndhams? There you go. That would be my list of the top five right there. That'll wrap it up for this edition of No DQ Video. Thank you all again for watching and supporting the channel. Stay tuned to NoDQ.com for the very latest WWE news and rumors, and I will see you all next time.